Good morning. Welcome to the Rotary Club of Hudson. My name is Marilyn Orr, president of the club, and we are thrilled to have you join us today. This meeting broadcast is available on HCTV, as well as our Rotary of Hudson YouTube channel and Facebook. Our club meets weekly using this digital platform, Zoom. When we meet in person, it's at Laurel Lake Retirement Community for breakfast. We hope to get back to that soon. We meet most Wednesday mornings from 7.15 to 8.30 a.m. So come out to join us for a meeting. We would love to have you as a guest. To learn more about Rotary, our club, and the impact we are having on our local community and the world, please visit our website, rotaryhudson.org. So enjoy this meeting today and help us share the message that Rotary opens doors of opportunity. Good morning, Rotarians, and uh, quite a few guests this morning, names I'm not familiar with. Uh, so welcome to the Rotary Club of Hudson. Our invocation this morning is by Bill Woolbridge. Good morning, uh, fellow Rotarians and all our visitors. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come together today to ask your blessing and guidance to a city, state, and nation that are divided in many ways. Help us to solve our differences in a peaceful way. Help us to seek first to understand before asking others to understand us. We have so much to be thankful for in Hudson, especially your support and love of us. We ask your blessings for the days ahead. Amen. Amen. And now to lead us in the pledge and the four-way test, Doug McDowell. Would you join me in the pledge, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And the four-way test of the things we think, say, and do. Number one, is it the truth? Number two, is it fair to all concerned? Number three, will it good, could build goodwill and better friendships? Number four, will it be beneficial to all concerned? Thank you, Doug. And now our president, Marilyn Orr. I would like to reiterate what our Sergeant in Arms said as we open the meeting. A special welcome to all of the community members who are joining us and especially to our district governor, Pat Myers, who is here as well today. I'd like to remind the club board members that we will be having a meeting immediately following our Zoom meeting today. It's anticipated that this meeting will start at 835 and should include at 930. And all members, all active club members are invited to join us. And again, David Basil has done a wonderful job of contacting today's speaker and coordinating his appearance with his staff. I'm going to get this started quickly today so that we can, here we go, so that we can <laughs> devote the full session to our speaker and, and answer your, all of your questions. Congress, uh, Congressman, oh, no, David, please take it away. <laughs> Thank you, President Marilyn. Uh, and again, I would like to extend a personal welcome to all of my fellow Rotarians and to all of our guests as well. Uh, at the end of uh, the presentation of the prepared remarks by Congressman Joyce, there will be an opportunity for questions and answers. Please submit your questions using the chat feature and I will then read the questions to the Congressman. Uh, it is indeed my uh, distinct honor and privilege today to again introduce Congressman Dave Joyce. Dave is a lifelong Ohioan and has dedicated his life to family and community. He was born in Cleveland in 1957, the son of a World War II veteran and a proud housewife. Dave had three siblings and grew up playing all sports, 
He graduated from West Geauga High School and received both his Bachelor of Arts in Accounting and his Juris Doctorate from the University of Dayton. Upon graduation from law school, Dave moved back to Cuyahoga County and worked as a public defender. While running for county prosecutor of Geauga County in 1988, Dave met a fellow West Geauga High School grad, Kelly, whom he married in 1990. In 2005, the Ohio State Women's Bar Association presented Dave with the Family Friendly Workplace Award for providing his employees a family-oriented office environment. And in 2008, Forbes Magazine named Geauga County the fourth best county in the nation to raise a family, citing the low crime rate and solid housing trends. Throughout his public career, Dave has assisted numerous communities throughout Ohio as well as a special prosecutor. In November 2012, Dave was elected as the representative of the 14th District, Congressional District of Ohio for the 113th Congress. This Congress, the 116th, is his fourth term in office. He co-founded the Bipartisan Task Force to End Sexual Violence in the 115th Congress, the last Congress, and is the Vice Chair of the Addiction, Treatment, and Recovery Caucus. Dave also serves on the Influential House Appropriations Committee and is the ranking member of the Subcommittee on Interior, Environment, and Related Agencies, where he is a fierce advocate of the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. Having established himself as a leader of the congressional bipartisan effort to preserve and protect the Great Lakes, Dave also serves as co-chair of the House Great Lakes Task Force and in 2019 received the inaugural Great Lakes Changemaker Award from the Council of the Great Lakes Region. In keeping with his past practices, Dave has returned roughly $800,000 from his congressional budget to the U.S. Treasury since joining Congress in 2013. Dave resides in Bainbridge Township in Geauga County along with his wife, Kelly. They have three children, Trenton, Kylie, and Bridie. Please join me in giving a warm rotary welcome to our 14th Congressional District Representative, Dave Joyce. Congressman, I'll turn it over to you. Is the Congressman unmuted? Thank you. I thought we had a master programmer. <laughs> uh, thank you all for that very kind uh, uh, introduction, David. It's always a pleasure to hear your voice and it, uh, nice to see all of you, although I wish it was at uh, Laurel Lake so we could all be having breakfast together. But hopefully soon we'll, we'll move on from all of this, but I uh, appreciate the chance to still chat with you and adapt to the circumstances we're, we're surrounded with. Um, I know that the initial part you asked me to talk about a, a Washington update. Well, I'd like to tell you something good, uh, but as most of you have probably seen uh, Nancy Pelosi's comments yesterday, uh, there, we seem to be worlds apart between getting any type of secondary COVID relief. Now, uh, when we first came out, obviously our world stopped on March 13th, as you all know. And shortly after that, uh, we got together on a bipartisan basis and crafted the CARES Act which provided COVID relief for most of us. But, uh, you know, and, and we did it over a two week period where we, uh, how we got to the number of two, 2.8 trillion, eventually got to but two trillion was at the time, um, the president's had uh, assistant Larry Kudlow came in and he said, if we don't put $2 trillion into the economy, the market's gonna collapse. So that's how we got the top line number to begin with. And it, it grew from there, obviously. But the combination of those things, we prepared you know, what had been the CARES Act, which had given money to the states and cities. But the most important thing we did was fund the unemployment compensation, uh, create the PPP program and uh, Main Street lending and uh, the economic injury disaster loans and push that through in about three weeks. And then spent the next couple of weeks working together, talking to businessmen and women uh, in the community and finding out how it's working for them and how it wasn't working for them. And how we could fashion some fixes, which we did then through May uh, and into uh, June, 
But when we first fashioned all this, uh, we thought we'd be in this for six weeks. And here we are six months out and businesses, you know, if we're being honest with each other, some businesses aren't going to make it. I mean, certainly some restaurants I read the other day that uh, in Ohio, 60% of the restaurants expect to close their doors for good at the end of the year. And some other businesses, uh, you know, that obviously just can't afford, can't continue to, to uh, get beat up and carry these losses forward. So I think it's quite important that we supply a lifeline to folks because no one asked for this. I mean, it, it dropped upon us from uh, China and, and it came into our country. And unfortunately, we need to learn the important lessons from this is that to be, A, be better prepared for something like this, uh, God forbid it ever happening again, but two, that we don't rely on China for critical things like PPE and, and some of the other medicines that are necessary for us for everyday life and bring back some of this manufacturing. And uh, so the jobs we do lose, we can pick back up. And the most important thing, I think, on top of getting some funding out uh, to the folks is also to retrain those folks who are losing their jobs to the jobs that do exist going forward. I think it's very important that we continue to help those. I mean, up, up until March 13th, the biggest complaint I heard going through the district was people didn't have enough workers. Well, if we're going to have a surplus of workers, then we need to train them for the jobs that exist when we do get back on <clears throat> line. But also, I think it's very important that we, uh, the other thing that we have with, uh, you see Nancy Pelosi talking about a large number that she wants to just put out there. Our position is that there's a lot of money, there's 135 billion left in the uh, PPP program that didn't get expended. There was money left, Main Street lending program never really took off like we expected. There's money in that pot, as well as the economic injury disaster loan. I think <clears throat> mostly unemployment compensation, we all know has been dried up but uh, we'll probably need a re refresher for those folks who are losing their jobs or are in the process of losing their jobs. But we need to fashion something to take care of those things using the funds that we've already appropriated but have not been expended in new funds. And uh, the, the biggest thing is you talk about helping cities and states. You know, here in Geauga County, the other day I was reading an article where they're uh, gonna take the CARES Act money that they were allowed and buy 10 new snow plows. Now what the hell that has to do with COVID, I don't know, but that has been a consistent problem with the federal government is once you give that money out, it never comes back. People say, hey, we didn't need it for testing. We didn't need it for other things. They'll find a way to spend it. And so uh, and the last thing you want to do is fund states like Illinois that were running in the uh, black, or running in the red anyhow, and then have them use that money towards uh, fixing problems like the pension problem that they created. We certainly want to make sure people at least maintain the, 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 the the status of life or as close to that as possible till we get through this together. But we certainly weren't out to enrich anybody. And so that's why there's been this major roadblock. I mean, the, the uh, I'm not trying to be political, but it is political in that, you know, the Democrats won't do anything to allow the president to look like he got a victory. And uh, you can see from the president, uh, I don't think the man's ever been uh, worried about spending more money. Uh, he's obviously built his company on debt. And so it's the idea that we're going into more debt doesn't necessarily bother him. Uh, I, you know, it's tough to do. As you heard, I had accounting and when I was an undergrad and we very seldom use the B word, billions, let alone trillions. And here we are uh, pushing trillions out the door. Uh, but as Kudlow said, you know, there's nowhere else in the world for uh, people to park their money, but America, you know, we're borrowing the money at three tenths of 1%. And that's all fine and good, but at the end of the day, we're still borrowing money and we can't continue on this path forever. We need to get through this together and, and get to the other side and then fix our remedies going forward from there. So this is always a very good group. You've got a lot of great questions, I know. So I want to leave plenty of time for those and I'm more than open to any of the questions that may come forward. And again, thank you for having me here this morning. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, uh, looks like you're ready for the questions, so we'll go ahead and uh, uh, get into them. Uh, I'm, I'm going to use a little bit of prerogative here uh, and ask you for an update on a topic that you and I have discussed many times over the years, and you know uh, that I'm as interested and concerned about it as you are, and that is the GLRI. Uh, could you just provide a brief update on that? Yes, thank you. I mean, just last week we had uh, the administrator Wheeler here in town to start the official actions of the EPA to finally delist 
uh, the Ashtabeel River is an area of concern, that's a huge deal. It doesn't happen very often once they're listed as an area of concern. Very seldom you uh, have the ability to take that off. And that was all related to GLRI uh, money and fixing the problem once and for all. And we've got five other places in, uh, that we're going through and, and either correcting the problems that have been areas of concern in the past and trying to fix them up so we can get back to having healthy rivers pouring into a healthy lake system. But the, uh, the money that we, we've accomplished to, uh, to get to this year for, was $330 million if we can ever get our final funding bill done. <clears throat> and we have it over a five-year sequence. And you ask why five years is because this is not something that we can do on a stop and start basis. The, t the work that we're doing, the testing that needs to be done has to have some continuity to it so that people know at the end that the results they're getting aren't uh, mitigated the next year because we stopped testing. We got to continue to doing these projects. And the most important thing we've been doing is what they call stream bank erosion uh, to keep uh, a lot of the farmers fields uh, at the day, you know, they took the old serpentine uh, creeks and straighten them out and started to drain their fields. Well, the trouble is that caused all the extra fertilizer to rush into these drains, which went into the creeks, which went into the rivers, which got into the lake. Uh, we've gone back and used some of this money to then go back to the old system and serpentining these creeks. So that the water rises, it rises and lands on the fields versus rushing through as fast as possible and getting out to the lake system. The one thing that we didn't contemplate when we got off, when we're all through here now with the depth, with the height of the Great Lakes this year, has been shore bank erosion. And unfortunately, you've seen it uh, the length of my district, but it certainly in uh, some of the areas like Mentor, where they, they, there's an old marsh there that uh, they're gonna tear through the, the, there, that we, we need to be able to fix that shore bank once and for all. And you can't do that piecemeal either, because if one person does it and the other people on both sides don't, then guess what happens? It comes in the sides and washes out the one person who did it right. So it has to be a process by which we fix it once and for all. And uh, you know, one of the biggest problems you have in Lake County is people coming into the county auditor complaining about having to pay taxes on less than half their lot because the other half's now in the lake. Uh, and so uh, the, the way we can do that, that is try to fix it in a way that creates a, a park system, if you will, where we create the border and, and do the, the, uh, the uh, lake, <coughs> preserve the shoreline in such a way that you also create bike path, walk path, and other type things so people can find it usable. And they've started up this project in Euclid, and we're talking about trying to get some money if we ever do an infrastructure bill to continue that down all through those uh, town cities along the lake up to Mentor and even possibly beyond. Uh, so that way we could put together a system of walkway. People might have less objection to deeding over their property to the state down the shoreline if in fact they would find that it's going to a cure their problem but also allow for folks to uh, be able to use this in the park-like system so um, that's one of the things we've been working on hoping to get that increased in the GLRI but in all in all when you think about this being 85 uh, percent of North America's fresh surface water I think we've done an admirable job of trying to get back on our feet and, and uh, correcting some uh, prior ills that none of us are responsible for, but unfortunately inherit and curing them to make sure that our kids and grandkids won't have it going forward. Thank you for the update on the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, Congressman. Uh, the next question uh, is a question about police funding uh, and the disparity between funding for the Cuyahoga County uh, Housing Authority and the Cleveland Police Department. Uh, the Cuyahoga County Metropolitan Housing Authority Department is short of funding for needed training as well as basic technology. Uh, they've essentially been defunded through cuts in HUD. And the question is what you would do to make sure that that police force for the CMHA is adequately funded. Well, uh, first off, you know, you can't compare uh, CMHA to Cleveland Police or any other police department because you're not comparing apples to apples. Uh, cities, obviously, and, and communities such as Hudson, they uh, have a tax levy or, or support their police departments independently, while CMHA is getting their money from HUD and the federal government. Now, you know, this defunding police is the craziest thing I've ever heard. Uh, we've asked policemen to do so much more than they ever have in the past 
and the reason uh, that uh, you know they're, they're coming upon so much more in the mental health areas and uh, unfortunately people are overdosing and, and they're going into situations where you know even domestic violence situations where they might have somebody who's under the influence of drugs and alcohol or both and, and or mental health issues and you know so you're asking them to do so, social work in in uh, EMA type of work, as well as then having to uh, be in a position where they might have to draw their weapon and do what unfortunately they're trained to do, and that is to, to uh, protect life and, and limb. So uh, when the police departments, one thing that I've been cautioning folks on using my myself and some other prosecutors are the big rush after some of the things that have gone on this year was everybody get a body camera. <clears throat> well, a couple problems that you'll have with that. One, uh, if you've ever seen a, a chase, the body camera will go up and it'll go down. You'll see the sky, you'll see the ground. You'll see the sky, you'll see the ground. Uh, secondly, that the, when you have that on all these officers, you create huge data problem because a uh, small police department like Painesville or probably Hudson too, you're talking about terabytes of data that, that they don't have to take somebody off the road to manage for every public record request that they get. There's other ways to get this accomplished. And one of them is to have a, in the um, top of the vehicle where you see the rack for the lights, you know, cameras that are 180 based. So therefore, whenever an officer gets out of his vehicle, he kicks on the camera and then the camera, you know, will then take into consideration the 180 view of everything that's happening. Because most of the times on traffic arrests or when police pull up to a situation, all that's going to be happening is in front of them. And so it, it gets and concentrates that and, and has a better view and more objective view. And the, the only thing the policeman has to worry about is the mic and the mic is automatically activated when they get on. There's other ways of getting this done. Secondly, we have to spend more money on training. Obviously, uh, you know, with mental health issues, you need to ha ex have officers who are experienced in the de-escalation of such incidents. Uh, and that is harder and harder to, get, to accomplish when you're coming up to people who are having mental issues and uh, you know let's face it all of us are old enough to know we abandoned mental health system a long time ago we don't no longer have those hospitals and unfortunately they became our county and state prison system and then it's not as though the people really get treated and then we're subjecting to going back into the street without ever having uh, the necessary uh, backing to, to, to make sure that they continue to take those meds and, and continue to do what's necessary to stay focused going forward so I think it's important that we, we fund the police in a proper way, but also spend the money on training police in, in systems and, and de-escalation. But the idea that you're going to send social workers to any type of those situation, I think you're going to see more casualties and you'll see fixes of that. <clears throat> the funding is in the CMHA. HUD obviously is controlled by the secretary and the you know, law enforcement. That's why we're trying to make a, whatever we fashion in, in the house would be something that would take them into consideration as well, as far as the levels of training and the amount of uh, uh, mandatory testing that's needed to be done to make sure that they're properly qualified to, to carry a firearm and, and do those type of things. Uh, and that is an important part of the training that would be necessary and mandated by anything we go forward. But as far as the pay uh, determination, I think you're gonna find most of the bigger city departments always pay more. And that's been a huge problem with smaller communities trying to keep their officers uh, because larger communities obviously pay more and can attract them away. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is requesting your thoughts on problems with our political system that has left us with the candidates we have to choose from for the presidency of the United States and your thoughts on why others would not even think about running for office. You know, when, when you think about all the people in our country, and, and this is the, the two folks we got left, that's, that's you wonder you know, why we can't attract better talent or more talented folks to, uh, to do this. But, you know, take a moment and look what happened with Amy Coney. I mean, the, the, here's a woman who, uh, you know, I, it was pretty admirable listening to her, not a note in front of her, answer all these questions. But why would you subject yourself to that? You know, why would you, uh, if you're having a distinguished legal career, I mean, a lady could probably make a million dollars a year at any law firm, and she's sitting there with her seven children and have somebody, uh, a senator from Hawaii, ask her if she's ever raped somebody. I mean, that, that's just nuts. That's beyond the pale. I mean, I, I don't, 
I don't know why anybody's subjecting themselves to it. I mean, I, there's days I ask myself why I subject myself to this. But you know, at the end of the day, I, I just have the feeling that uh, in my heart that I'm trying to do the right thing and do good by everyone here. <clears throat> and I, you know, I really appreciate the opportunity to represent folks. And I certainly love the area that I represent. But running for president right now is, uh, you know, I, I, I just got to think that we have to do more talking and uh, much more listening uh, and that, that's a huge problem I found is that, you know, everybody uh, in D.C. knows a lot, just ask them. Uh, but, you know, what we need to do is have more folks who sit there and listen. And I, I have found in my bipartisan, I'm going to see if I can take the glare off my five head here by moving this a little bit. <laughs> uh, you, know, they, they, uh, you know, when we do the uh, problem solvers, is a group that I mean, it's 25 Republicans, 25 Democrats. We sat down during all this. We pushed in, uh, our, our ability to, to put together a one and a half trillion dollar settlement that if you'd asked me that day uh, where it would go, I'd said nowhere. But then the president came out and said that, you know, he thought this was a good idea and all of a sudden it got legs. Well, that was an art of compromise between people who came to the table and said, uh, we can do this, we can't do that, and gave and, and took and, and, and pushed it on their ideas and formatted something that worked. It was higher than what we wanted to get. It was lower than what the Democrats came to the table with, but eventually it's compromise. And compromise works. If you sit there and listen to each other and talk about the things that you can agree on, you'll find it's easier to work on the things you disagree upon. But we just don't do that. And we have a lot of this top-down stuff like they're talking about now. It's Nancy Pelosi's uh, program or it's nobody's. Well, that Paul Ryan did that to us too, and it just doesn't work. As a collective body, one thing I've noticed is that we're definitely afraid of hearings. We have stupid show hearings like they're doing now with the Supreme Court, but it doesn't get down to the meat of the thing, like well, what's the matter with healthcare? Where are our problems with the Great Lakes? Where are our problems with policing? Have experts. We're no, none of us are experts. Uh, we're 435 independent folks who come there you know, trying to do good, but none of us are really experts in anything. But they have doctors talk about well, the things that are necessary and scientists for a corona uh, and how we can fix this problem and how we can make sure that we prevent uh, this from ever happening again. And sit down and have those hearings so the American public actually get to hear what's going on and get to hear what the, the choices are so we can, then you can talk to me as your representative so we can make intelligent decisions on how we wanna move forward. And we're definitely afraid of it. In my eight years there, I said, I think I've told you this before, we don't work anywhere near hard enough. When I was in trial, we worked 12, 18 hour days and you never worried about it, you just did your job. And here, you know, uh, it, it's, you go in on uh, late Monday afternoon, you vote Monday night on usually a bridge renaming or post office, Tuesday, Wednesday, and you're out Thursday afternoon, or you go in Tuesday and you're out Friday. <clears throat> and other than my committee hearings, appropriations, we don't have any of those big hearings. And the ones we do, everybody wants to play gotcha games instead of telling, having the real research and having the real work done to tell American people the truth. So. I think that's one of the ways we're going to get there. I don't know if this election will get us where we need to go, but I think it's going to take a, a groundswell of folks like yourselves in every community to say enough's enough. The biggest thing I hear when I go around a community is uh, whether from Democrats or Republicans is you guys got to stop this. You guys got to work together and get things done for the American people. And I tell them I wholeheartedly agree. Okay, thank you, Congressman. The next question is a follow-up on the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative funding for mm -hmm. shoreline erosion control. Uh, as the lakes continue to rise, if we don't use a natural system for control, uh, the, the questioner comments, cementing the shoreline will just cause more trouble. What kinds of protection measures regarding land water interface do you have in mind for the paths, the bike paths and walking paths that need a s stable uh, underpinning? It's a good question. I mean, the, the biggest problem you have is how do you relieve the, the excess water. I mean, we're at uh, people coming out in their docks underwater. Uh, and so I took it up with the Army Corps of Engineers and our only relief is Niagara Falls, surprisingly. I mean, there's nothing else you can really do with it. And there's only so much water that Niagara Falls can process in the course of a day without flooding out uh, everybody below Niagara Falls. And it's not like they can control that. It's whatever the natural flow is over the falls. And so, <clears throat> uh, you know, the, 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 we've looked at a bunch of different ones. It's not necessarily a concrete wall. It's that crushed rock that is then put into place uh, 
there, there's a technical name for it, but I'll call it crushed rock for the moment, that creates, as you've seen it before, but it has to be a continuous uh, spot, a, a length of it, that really takes into, uh, to be able to work, because we're just, people, as I've noticed when I've gone on uh, boat rides with the mayors along the side, you know, people are tossing over old concrete and other things, that's, it, on top of defacing the shoreline, it, it really doesn't help at all. And eventually that comes in and washes out the sea. And so we're trying to keep that from going into the water. But, uh, you know, I'm, if we could do buffers or something else, or you know, obviously marshlands would be a, a nice way of getting that created. But, you know, people aren't as interested in seeing marshes outside their doors. They are seeing the water in the coastline. But I, I've seen it now in, in the city of Minner when he bought over a, a Minner Lagoons, which was in horrible shape and had been an EPA problem and spent all the money to get it fixed up have now gotten in a position where they're getting uh, swamped out because all the water coming in uh, because you can't control it. And they started to do, they had to do a necessary set of this uh, just to keep uh, water from coming back into the marina. And, uh, but they're losing shoreline at 20 feet a, a week at one point during the spring when it was really coming down. And you see just straight lines of clay that were getting cut off the shoreline. And, uh, it's a tremendous problem, and I, I don't even want to uh, pretend to be an engineer, but I, I do uh, task these the uh, Army Corps of Engineers with trying to get us a, some type of fix. They seem to like this idea with what's taking place in Euclid, which is about a, a decade in uh, preparation to get there, and it, it has it's a, an expensive proposition, but that the reason that it might be able to work is if you've got all those cities to buy in the states and the federal government and be able to do something together and target all of our funds in a way that will fix that. But, you know, even if you do Euclid to the first couple uh, cities in Lake County, you're still gonna have problems with the next ones up. And this one's all the way up to Geneva and then to Ashtabula too on our side. Uh, I don't know about, uh, I haven't had a chance to, to take it up with Marcy Captor about what's happening on the Western side, but it's certainly a big problem here on the Eastern side. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question uh, is asking why the president does not follow NA, NIH policy guidance regarding the wearing of facial coverings and social distancing. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I can't tell you why. He's his own guy. I can tell you one thing though, Governor Dwight's done a hell of a job. And he, you know, I feel bad for Amy Acton and, and the governor. He did a nice job of, granted, you know, nobody knew what they're first getting into, but he did a good job of scaring people into wearing, uh, staying home and wearing the face mask and, and getting, uh, and trying to contain this. We were shut down quicker than probably other states, but we were allowed to come back out. Unfortunately, with springtime and people gathering, it created issues that, uh, um, that he couldn't necessarily get his arms back around and certainly, uh, as predicted, when school started and kids went back to school, that would help with an uptick. We do have to do it in a state-by-state, uh, state, county by county basis because, you know, let's face it, uh, I was talking to a friend who she represents Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and I said, how are things going out there? So we've doubled. I said, really? Yeah, we went from five cases to 11. <laughs> it's relative in the community you're at. I mean, it double sounds world when we think that's it if you talk about doubling the number the numbers are different throughout uh, each jurisdiction and you know look no one asked for this and no one really knows what's going on and i wish the president would have taken his unfortunate uh, uh, turn when he got the the coronavirus to come out of it and say look i made a mistake you know this thing i got the best treatment and i got things that none of us are going to get uh, but you know wear the mask just do what's necessary and and you know, we'll try to work through, we get the vaccine that everybody that is safe and reliable. Now it's, uh, you know, the, one of the problems with governors uh, done such a good job of shutting it down is now you have people who, you know, as we know, elective surgeries are lifeblood of most of these hospitals. And you got people who don't want to come back in or go do those things now because they were afraid of it. And uh, they want to leave the nursing home because they don't want to come back and have to be quarantined for 14 days when they leave. Well, you know, those are, we have to work through those things and we have to remember we're all in this together and uh, nobody asked for this, but wearing the mask and doing those little things, uh, 
I just can't believe here after six months, I'm still so such a knucklehead that I get all the way up to the store and remember, oh, damn, I forgot my mask. You got to walk all the way back to my car <laughs> because you're just not used to, uh, you know, carrying nothing with you all the time. But, you know, it's a little thing to ask of folks. And, and uh, for those of you, I've had the opportunity, unfortunately, to fly. I was going to drive back and forth to D.C., but uh, I wanted to, be, you know, give a little boost to the airline industries because that's an important industry that, uh, unfortunately, is really on the ropes. And we don't see that coming back for a while. But the planes have never been cleaner. and They've never smelled better. And uh, if you fly on Southwest, they leave the middle seat open on every one still till the end of November. So that's been very nice. Uh, United, not so much. United and American both pack the planes, but they are still very clean. And uh, they give you towels and other things and, and make everybody's masked. And I've not heard anybody complain the time they're on the planes about being masked. And uh, at least on Southwest, they walk around and hand you a bottle of water. So you'll get a little something for your, for your ride, but that's about it. Uh, so they, they, there's not the service that there might have been in the past. They don't give you those bad cookies or, or other things, but at least you get to where you need to go on a timely basis. But uh, it's, you know, the, the payroll support program was necessary for those folks because, uh, you know, if you've been out to, to uh, Hopkins Airport, there's a lot of United flights or jets sitting at the D terminal. And same thing when you go into Dulles, when you go into uh, Baltimore, Southwest jets sitting idle. And it's going to take a while for them to come back. And so they think it's going to be the second or third quarter of next year now before they see the, the real, the hospitality industry as a whole returning to where they were prior to this. So those are the things that we need to factor in when we fashion any type of relief for these folks because they really didn't do anything wrong. Uh, they just got caught in this pandemic. Thank you. Uh, the next question is asking for your position on the issue of adequate funding of social services for seniors, specifically Medicare and Social Security, which both appear to have timelines that show they are going to be unsustainable uh, at some time in the not too distant future. Well, you know, I certainly have always made the position and, and point very clear that those who are entitled to those services and once engaged those services should re receive those services without any cuts. You, 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 you know where you're going in life and you planned on this and you should be able to receive it. However, I do think that we need to have an intelligent discussion, <laughs> as crazy as that might seem, on what it's going to take to continue to fund those going forward. Because we can't continue to tell our kids and grandkids that it, the Social Security is going to be there for them if we're not doing the things that are necessary to make sure there's a funding pot uh, for them and to make sure that these are, are going to be uh, there going forward. That's an important part of what we, we're supposed to be doing is taking care of you know, all the seniors who are in, in the system now and making sure that those who are paying in are not paying into a, a program that will not exist when it comes time for them to get to it. Now we can do that by changing some of the benefits later for those who are coming, you know, the younger people who are going into it to explain to them now that the, here are the costs and here, here's what you'll be receiving. And I think the good part about doing that is that uh, will help educate those kids that, you know, this was not meant to be a retirement savings. You have to start saving for yourself in life. And when you start to see the uh, staggering numbers of folks who haven't adequately saved for their own uh, future and the, the, that they didn't have three or six months of savings going into this pandemic, the percentage was so high, it was it's staggering. And, and so we got to start to educate folks about the need to save and take care of themselves going forward. And that while Social Security will be there, it's not, it shouldn't be your only retirement system. It should be more there for you. Uh, that you've taken care of for your time at work. We should encourage uh, you know, companies that are doing the 401ks and, and doing those type of programs. So make it more uh, beneficial for them to offer the plans and, and better for people who are employed to be involved in those plans so that they will have those savings for themselves going forward. Okay. Thank but you. no, and I'm cutting any of those. And I hate those things that I've seen those ads now talking in the presidential race about this person's cutting, that person's cutting, that's all BS. And it's a, it's a shame, but it comes up. And that's the reason no one wants to tackle the serious issues, you know, that uh, what it's going to take to fix these problems once and for all, because everybody's afraid of these ads coming up in election year that they can't uh, have the time or afford to rebut. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next topic 
uh, is thought, your thoughts on infrastructure needs uh, throughout the nation, which are great and are a way to provide jobs. Uh, everyone talks about it, but the follow through seems not to have been there. Uh, your thoughts on, on those topics? Nothing in my time in Congress, nothing has had more bipartisan support and less get done than infrastructure. It's unbelievable. And every, you know, it seemed like every other week we were having infrastructure week <laughs> and uh, we still haven't accomplished anything. And then we talked about doing it as part of this uh, coming out of COVID, a million dollars uh, or a trillion dollars and going right towards uh, uh, infrastructure. I think it's important. Uh, I think there's a lot of things. I think we also need to do it in a way that's targeted between federal officials, your state and local officials, because you have to, you know, I know earmarking is an ugly word, but you have to take the money and spend it on your highest priorities in every single state. I mean, if there's a bridge that needs to be replaced because it's going to fall into the lake, well, then we need to fix that, right? Uh, we, you know, we shouldn't let some other bureaucrat uh, distribute that money. We need to, to target and get a hold of our uh, local officials and spend that money accordingly. Uh, secondly, if you would have asked me prior to this, if broadband should have been part of the uh, infrastructure package, I'd always said no. I think that's a, a private corporation thing. I've changed my tune after this, uh, only because there's parts of my district, our district, in, in uh, Trumbull and Ashtabula County that have no connectivity. And so, therefore, you'd be out there and you would see uh, family, although the McDonald's is only open for drive through you'd see families sitting in the parking lot so they could download their homework. Uh, because telehealth and telemedicine are here to stay. Uh, telehealth has really become advantageous for those folks with mental health conditions. So they may not want to reach out, but reaching out online without having to go to a doctor's office or go near a clinic where you know, someone might see them, God forbid. And so it helps with the privacy aspect of it. These are things that need to be put in, uh, into the next infrastructure bill that we do and at least lay the cable and let the, the private companies that work out the deal with the, the individual families from there. But uh, as far as a whole, I think you know, that you're absolutely right in that investment in infrastructure is an investment in America and is an investment in jobs. And if we're gonna, we're gonna have some trouble in the ways getting back to work, then we need to be able to use that as a tool to help those folks who may not be uh, gainfully employed, God forbid, because their company went under during uh, this pandemic. Okay. Uh, the next question has to do with your position on what the baseline hourly wage should be, uh, given the need uh, for people to save for their own future uh, and yet have sufficient income to support basic needs currently. Well, you know, I, I've never been a fan of dictating an hourly rate. Uh, I mean, there, obviously every state has set the minimum wage and similar to, to doing it, uh, you know, in the way we're handling Corona state by state, I think that minimum wage issue is a good state by state issue as well. Uh, first off, states have rights. Secondly, uh, you know, I think it's important because if you mandate a $15 an hour uh, wage in throughout the country, well, you know, if you come into some areas of the district where three people might be working for $10 at McDonald's, well, guess what's going to happen? You have two people at 15 and one gets fired. And that isn't what we're trying to get accomplished. What we saw prior to the pandemic was that the unemployment was getting so tight that people were advertising higher wages. It's the first time I'd ever seen Dunkin' Donuts and, and uh, other fast food restaurants like that advertising their hourly rate outside their uh, establishment. And you know, you're getting kids who are moving for the extra dollar an hour. Uh, but, you know, it, it incentivizes them to, to keep on moving up because I don't know anybody who uh, comes into the work uh, environment and wants to stay at the minimum wage. They, they get involved and they want, well, hopefully want to make more as, and learn more and become better at what they're doing and continue to move up to scale. And so uh, you, we've noticed that wherever you go, most of the uh, employers are saying, look, we, here's what we start at, but you can be at almost double that in two, three years, if you learn exactly what we need you to know with the CNC shop or other type of uh, tooling or machine areas. And the jobs are there, they just can't find the people to work at it. And I know I get criticized for saying that, but I'm hearing that from employers. I'm not just making that up. They have to find people who will show up every day, who will pass drug tests and uh, you know, learn the trades that are associated with making the equipment that's necessary. And uh, you know, I was at three places yesterday uh, 
in Aurora that uh, all of them have jobs that are open and can't find people to fill them and uh, are working three shifts now and, and would even work Saturdays and Sundays if they could find enough people to do that and are paying in excess of what a $15 minimum wage was anyhow. So I'm not a fan of mandating an amount of money, but I am a, a big fan of making sure that we train people for the jobs that exist and get involved with our uh, community colleges to make sure that people have the ability to get to the training. And you know, some of that, I, as I tell business owners, you're gonna have to be able to train the folks. If we, we can get them to in the door, we can do things to help them understand that uh, manufacturing is cool, uh, then you need to do the things to show them the job and, how, and show them a path forward. And one of the things that uh, we, we're trying to get the folks to, uh, you gotta break the, the cycle at high school levels. And there's a lot of parents. You know, parents want their kids to go to college. Well, you know, so in, in Lake County, they have a uh, thing called Alliance Working Together, and I might have talked about it before. But they, they started their, uh, they recruited a bunch of employers, went together, recruited a lady who was teaching at Lakeland, got her to then come to work for them and train folks. And now they go out into the high schools and, and uh, you know, at, uh, career nights and explain to parents that, Look, and, and your son comes here, daughter comes here in five to six years, not only will they have a skill in a trade, they'll also will help pay for them to go to college and they'll end up at the end of that time with a career, with a degree and with no debt. And that's win, win, win. And, and we got to break that message through because uh, one of the other things I think is going to have a problem here is going to be colleges. I mean, there's a lot of small colleges that don't come back out of this as well. Uh, so it, it's important that we start to figure out how we're going to take care of folks and get make sure that they, uh, we have the training for the jobs that exist. Okay, thank you. The next question, uh, how do you see the evolution of foreign policy if President Trump is reelected? Uh, do you see it as more or less harsh toward communist and socialist regimes? Well, you know, let's, being truthful with each other, uh, you know, China, somebody needed to take on China. I mean, there's ways of taking people on, but obviously, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, President Trump only knows the bull in the China shop method. So uh, that's how he, in effect, goes forward on everything. Uh, but, you know, we've always said that they're not an ally. They're not a friend. They are an enemy. And they're, they're, they, they, they want to, their goal is to strive for world domination. And they've been doing it monetarily because, let's face it, if you can subsidize all your companies and not have to ever worry about making a profit, it's pretty damn easy to make sure that you can undercut American steel. If you look what they've done in South America or in other areas where the uh, Belt Road Privilege or whatever the hell they call their program, they go down there and they loan money to all these countries to put in their systems for infrastructure, their ports, their oil and uh, gas pipelines. And you know, guess what? When they default on it, China will loan it. And so therefore they own the resources. You go into Africa, they're, they're gobbling up the resources there of critical minerals that are very important to not only our defense industry, but to our communications industry. And so, yes, they needed to be taken on. And uh, you know, Russia is always, we know where Russia's at. They're, they're, they're always been an adversary and their game is more power. Uh, China has been more uh, slow uh, world domination and doing it monetarily while pretending to be a friend. So they needed to be confronted. And I think it's important that we continue uh, engaging them. And then in the meantime, uh, bring those jobs that have been over there back home. You know, it's, it's China, as the costs rise there, people are starting to realize that uh, it, it might be better to manufacture things at home. The supply lines that got it disrupted during this pandemic, people are starting to understand that maybe we should manufacture these things back home. It's sickened me to find out that 95% of the acetaminophen and ibuprofen that you take comes from China, manufactured in China. 85% of the mental health drugs are, are manufactured in China. You know, again, they're not a friend. You know, it, it, we should be making it home or we should be doing it with allies, uh, but we certainly shouldn't be helping them. And, and I think we could have to continue to take on communism wherever it uh, rears its ugly head. And you look what I happen to go on a delegation down to the Venezuelan border. And when you see these poor folks coming over the border into Colombia, and then carrying back, one guy had three car tires on his back. Hopefully he had a trike or he dropped a tire somewhere along the way. But I mean, it, these poor people are carrying the, and they, with their kids, toilet paper, uh, paper towels, the, the necessities, every day having to, or every other day having to make the trip. 
because the other problem this young man was telling me is that they have brownouts. So you can't buy buttermilk or other things because you don't know if your electricity will be on when you get back. So therefore you have to continue to make these trips over to Columbia and, and get these uh, things. So there's a classic example right in our backyard in Venezuela that communism doesn't work. Socialism doesn't work. And America is the greatest country in the world. And we've got to make sure that people understand. That. Okay. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions this morning for the congressman? I don't see any other questions coming over, Congressman. Up, oh, one more. Can I make, uh, can I, uh, can uh, I make a comment? Sure. Food. Oh, I just want to thank the Congressman for working across the aisle and working together with others. And uh, all the years that I worked in you know, government relations, I cherish all of you that can work together on solving problems. So. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're very kind. Thank you. And, and I was pretty honored to receive the Chamber of Commerce this year. They recognized the top, uh, I don't know if it was 10 or, or 15 bipartisan uh, lawmakers, and I happen to be one of them. And I, you know, I, I, uh, I, I get some grief from, as you can imagine, from some sides, but it's, I, you know, the, I always have held true to the same thing that uh, we might be elected with a red or blue jersey on, but the day we get elected, we should take that off, put on a red, white, and blue jersey, and do what's right for our country. And I think we need more of that. So thank you very much, Pat. I appreciate that. Uh, we do have one more question, Congressman. This will be the last question. Uh, it has to do with food insecurity, which still exists. Sure. And your thoughts on how we can, uh, as a country, uh, assist in that issue. You know, I, I went down to uh, the second week of all this. I went down to the food bank when they were still doing it at their Waterloo location at Greater Cleveland Food Bank. And there were cars wrapped around 90 all the way back up to 185th and getting off the exits. And we loaded cars for four straight hours with the National Guard. And finally, the Cleveland police had to cut it off because they had to, they had so many policemen there to reroute all this traffic. That's why they've moved it down to Muni Lot and where they can have a better access to it uh, since then. But that was eye-opening to me you know, to, to see all the folks who unfortunately need this. And I've worked a few other ones in Lake County and other counties uh, around. And you understand that, you know, unfortunately, people have to make some painful choices. And, and when food is one of them, uh, that, that, that is something that we need to make sure we shore up and take care of. And, and also the, the idea that our food lines, you know, there's a, a run on beef and, and, and other things here. And uh, friends who are in the house with me who are farmers were saying that the unfortunate part was it wasn't so much the, the shortage of the beef, it was the ability to process the beef in a timely fashion because the pandemic was closing down slaughterhouses. And there should be an ability, which I'm fond of is having more local uh, butcher. So like here, Kelly and I buy a, a cow up at the farm, uh, at the uh, fair in Ashtabula. And we split it with other families because we couldn't, when the, when the kids were home, we we get we'd get through more of it, but we split it with other families. But you take it to a local, the Trumbull County meat locker, and then they, they process it and you get it back. Well, they can't do that on the whole scale. They can do it that because it's uh, something local in uh, for the uh, uh, 4-H but they can't do that in a way that it would help process it to make sure that we don't have these problems with getting food and getting uh, poultry and beef onto the tables and, and not have it held up because it has to be processed by these huge food lines that are around. I mean, yeah, I, I'm sort of thrilled to see the local uh, grows, the local uh, farmers and the table, farm to table restaurants popping up. And I think that's a great thing. We need to continue to do that and making sure that then the, any excess from that is taken care of and again, make sure that our food centers are making that available to the folks who, who need it. But I voted for uh, every one of the, the bills that uh, allowed for, uh, you know, whether it was SNAP or other uh, programs to make sure that not only uh, is the food available for those, but also the kids, unfortunately, who are not getting their, what they would normally be their meals at school, at least have access to those meals through either the churches or uh, local non-governmental organizations like yourselves who are willing to help uh, process those meals and make sure kids get them. So I think that's an important part of America being America and helping each other to get where we need and make sure that the kids are healthy and uh, safe during all this. Thank you very much, Congressman. 
Uh, again, it's been a, a pleasure to have you with us this morning. Thank you for your, for your comments and for your candor and uh, your excellent answers to some questions. So I will Thank turn. You. It's always a pleasure to be with all of you. Some of the great questions. You guys always keep me on my toes, even on Zoom. <laughs> Thank you again, Congressman, and thank you to your staff for helping uh, make certain that we could pull this all together, and to your staff for joining us this morning as well. And with sure. that, I will turn the meeting back over to you, President Marilyn. Well, thank you again, Mayor Diesel. This was, was wonderful, uh, as usual. Next week on October 21st, we will host the three candidates vying for the at-large open seat on the Hudson City Council. Nicole Kowalski, Sharif Mansour, and Sarah G. Norman. So we, we thank you again for making those arrangements. Uh, I also would like to thank all of the community members who, who joined us today. Come back again. This is how we roll. And invite your family, your, uh, your friends, and your neighbors. We're going to close as our tradition has been uh, with looking back at this day in history. In 1066, at the Battle of Hastings, King Harold II of England was defeated by the invading army of William the Conqueror, the Duke of Normandy, in the Norman Conquest, which established Norman rule in England. In, 18, in 1926, Winnie the Pooh makes his literary de debut. A. A. Mill, uh, the British author, uh, wrote a series of stories for his child, Christopher Robin, and this beloved uh, character of childhood came into to being. And in 1947, the first human to fly faster than the speed of sound, American Air Force test pilot Chuck Yeager uh, flew the Bell X-1, an experimental aircraft at Mach 1.07 in an altitude of 450, uh, no, 45,000 feet and in doing so became the first person to break the sound barrier. So again, have a wonderful day and thank you very much. Uh, and the, the uh, club board meeting will begin momentarily. Thank you for joining us.